Hey guys, IROCKTHS here, and today I want to show you how to build a tournament roster from scratch in Perfect Team, uh, whether you are just getting started with Perfect Team, or if you already play with Perfect Team but want to understand how to get going with tournaments and haven't really engaged with that before. I wanted this to be kind of a general how to get started with Perfect Team with basically zero knowledge of uh, how tournaments work or how to build a tournament roster, I guess is the better way of saying it. One thing I am going to allude to a few times is at the end of the video, I say I'm going to build a roster in about 30 minutes or try and build a roster based on the advice I have in this video that ended up not making it into the final cut of this video. The footage that I used, the the, the, cap, the video that I had for that, uh, it's not it's not usable. And I've been working on this video, editing it for two weeks, and I really do not feel like going back and re-recording that footage, recreating all of that uh, would be a significant, uh, significant time investment to do that. And I have another idea for something I want to do in a follow-up video that I think will work instead. So I'll talk about more of that after I go through all the information here. Um, we're going to start out with talking about the ratings and out of the park and what they do, what they affect, and a discussion at a very basic level of how the game functions. Uh, if you already know all that information or you don't really care, uh, you can go ahead and skip ahead to the part where I just talk about uh, what cards, what kind of things I'm looking for in cards, but I highly encourage you to check that out. Uh, if you have any questions about how ratings work or what things do, uh, tries to go through a lot of that and just basically spell it out very clearly what all of these things do. So one of the first things you need to know about Perfect Team in general, and probably the most important thing to take away from this video, is that overall is a social construct. This is something I say all the time. I started saying it originally a little bit sarcastically, but I really kind of believe that it really is giving voice to the somewhat random, I guess, for lack of a better word, nature to where overalls end up, considering how good card ratings look or how even cards play. The game calculates a card's overall by doing a, a algebra problem, putting in its ratings, and trying to come up with a final overall based on all of that information. The position plays into it a little bit too. Um, catchers, center fielders, and shortstops get a little bit of a higher overall for their ratings than other positions do. Looking at where the ratings are how good they are, and trying to come up with a rough overall value based on all of that information. Uh, my favorite example, or one of my favorite examples this year, is this Dave Kingman card. Came out with the game on launch. It is still being played uh, in iron tournaments, and this card is absolutely bonkers. Some of these ratings here are much more valuable than others. This is true for batters, and it's very much the case for pitching this year. Power creep is inevitable in any live service game, whether that's something like Ultimate Team, uh, traditional like uh, card games like Yu-Gi-Oh! Magic the Gathering, or even something like uh, Path of Exile, Call of Duty, uh, Fortnite, all those kind of games, they all have power creep in them. The same is true in uh, the park. Cards will debut with lower overalls later in the cycle than they would have earlier in the cycle. Or a better way of phrasing that is a card will come out later in the cycle that has much better ratings than other cards with the same overall. So looking at overall isn't really that helpful. There are plenty of cards that came out on launch that have fairly high overalls, but they've been power crept by lower rated cards. So overall is what we call a composite rating. It's a rating based on all the other ratings in here just like oh just like uh almost every other composite rating we talk about pretty much ignore them uh the only thing that overall should mean to you at this point is can i use this card in the tournament i'm running 
let's get started with talking about batting rates. We're starting with, uh, we've got the Dave Kingman here. Um, so we're gonna use him as our example to go through uh, what each of these ratings means. There's two things that I want to talk about that really carry through the rest of the video. First, everything is on a rate basis. When I say power equals more home runs, what it really translates to is, well, he has 111 power, so he has X percent chance to have a plate appearance and in a home run. The other thing to keep in mind is that higher is always better. A higher number always gives you a higher chance of the desired outcome. So we're gonna start here uh, with BABIP. BABIP stands for batting average on balls in play. I will put the formula to calculate BABIP here. And by calculate BABIP, I mean calculate the statistic BABIP, not the rating here. BABIP, which again is batting average on balls in play, affects the likelihood that a ball you hit that is not a home run ends in a hit. Generally, batters tend to hover around a 300. It can vary from year to year, it can vary from era to era, but for the most part, the league average, batting average on balls in play, 301, might be 298, something like that, but it's gonna be around that. There are some batters that are just better at getting hits on balls they put in play. Obviously, Dave Kingman was not one of them, but he was really, really good. And he's a really good player. He tends to hit a lot of fly balls. When he hits a ground ball, he hits it on the ground to the pull side. You can still do stuff to move your defense to be in a better position to defend those ground balls. The higher the Babbitt braiding, the higher the BABIP stat is going to be. There's a lot of balls in play. A team is usually going to have to get 18 to 20 outs on a ball in play. Regardless of how good their pitchers are, having a higher BABIP means you have better results on one of the more likely outcomes of an at-bat, which is a ball in play. What it doesn't affect, it doesn't affect whether you hit a home run or not, whether that goes for extra bases or not. Uh, it doesn't affect where the balls hit. Uh, all that is determined separately. All it does is affect the chance that the plate appearance ends in a hit. We'll go over power next. It's the chance that you hit a home run. It doesn't affect whether a hit is an extra base hit. I think in MLB The Show and in some older baseball games, power can also manifest in how hard you hit the ball when you make contact. That's not the case in Out of the Park. All power does is affect how likely a batter is to hit a home run. Uh, so you can see Dave Kingman here has a ton of power. He hits a ton of home runs. The opposite of that, basically, is avoid case, which correlates to fewer strikeouts. So you can see here, Dave Kingman has pretty low avoid case. He strikes out a lot. Still one of my favorite cards though. You have higher avoid Ks, you strike out less. Next here we have gap power. So gap power is the chance that a ball in play that ends up as a hit is an extra base hit. That's probably an overly complicated way of explaining it. Uh, the easiest way to explain it is how often a batter gets an extra base hit. Not home runs, but doubles and triples. Higher gap power does not mean you hit more triples, it's just you get a double or triple. But you do need pretty good BABIP to really take advantage of it. I correlates to walks, it does not correlate to pitch selection, it does not correlate to running up pitch counts in an at-bat, it doesn't correlate to anything other than your walk rate. So the only one of these uh, basic batting ratings that we haven't talked about is contact. Contact is meaningless. Now, if you're coming from franchise mode, base game, uh, whatever you want to call the non-PT side of out of the park, well, one, you're probably saying, what's this BABIP rating here? This profile looks completely different than what I get in franchise mode. They are breaking out this contact rating into the three components of contact rating. Uh, this is a the base game editor, just to illustrate. So I'm, here in the uh, editor in base game, uh, this is a 2023 save, so pretty much what you load up when you load into base game. So what contact is, is it is an attempt to reproduce a batting average. And a batting average essentially comes down to how often a player strikes out, how often a player gets a hit on balls in play, and how often a player hits home runs. And since we know what we 
don't really need his contact rating. Uh, we have all the information that is wrapped up in the contact rating in the card. Before we move on to uh, base running here, uh, I do want to touch on sack bunting and bunt for hit really quickly. Uh, they're pretty self-explanatory. Sack bunt is how good a batter is at laying down a sacrifice bunt. So there's a guy on first or second and you're trying to score him. Uh, I believe it also affects squeezes, but I wouldn't swear by that. Um, and then bunt for hit is any other bunt attempt. So let's move on to the uh, base running numbers here. You got speed, stealing, and base running. And these are very confusing uh, to new players and even experienced players. The primary thing speed does is it increases or affects your stolen base attempt rate. That is, you are on base, there's a base open in front of you, how likely are you to attempt to steal? Here are some other things that speed has a mild impact on, but not significant. It can affect triple rate slightly. Uh, it can affect bunt for hit success. It can have a mild impact on whether you ground into a double play or leg it out, but not enough to really worry about. Uh, it has absolutely no bearing on defense, primarily what it's going to be affecting it increases the chance that a player will attempt a stolen base. Stealing increases the chance that that is successful. So speed determines how likely they are to attempt a stolen base. Stealing determines how successful they are. And base running is almost everything else you can do on the base on the base pass. Uh, I like to call it the toot plan and fart slam rating. Thrown out on the base paths like a nincompoop and fielder allows runner to score like a moron. They are not official statistics, yet we keep lobbying. Plays that don't show up as errors, um, especially fart slam, it's not gonna show up in the score sheet as an error, but it's a mental mistake. And a toot plan is another mental mistake. It's really hard to explain a toot plan. Uh, if you want more examples, uh, you could search Tuplan, you could search Fart Slam, and enjoy watching some really silly baseball highlights. Now let's talk about the fielding ratings. Infielders and outfielders have basically the same ratings. Uh, infielders have turned double play, that doesn't affect outfield at all, but the other three ratings are do the same thing. Uh, catchers are weird and different, we'll talk about them in a bit. The first rating is a fielder's range and that's how well they do at getting to a ball hit in their zone. That's not just how fast they are, that's also them taking the right route to a ball. Uh, the higher your range, the more balls hit into your zone that you're going to uh, get a glove on. Next up is the error. The error is the chance that a player commits a fielding error or a throwing error. Um, so higher, your error rating, the fewer errors you're going to commit. Players with a uh, high error rating and high range might have more errors than someone with a low range and low error rating because the low range is just not getting to balls to even have a chance to commit an error. But error rating uh, is the chance that you either you drop it, you flub it, you throw it wide, you throw it into the stands, whatever it is. Arm is how strong your arm is and how accurate it is. Now, arm does not affect throwing errors. Think of it as, like I said, you throw it into the stands or do you throw it at a guy's shoes and it's hard for him to actually dig it out. Not necessarily an error, but a wide throw. So an error is going to, you know, allow someone to advance. A throwing error is gonna be, you know, it's like, it's like egregious. Whereas, you know, arm is just how likely it is to be on target and how fast it's getting there. And then turn double play for infielders only is how well they do at, you know, receiving the ball and then making sure they're on second, they tag second, and then turning, pivoting, throwing to first, you know, pivoting, throwing to first, uh, not transferring the bobble, uh, throwing around the runner who's probably running straight down the line you wanna, you wanna throw it down, um, all of those kind of things. We'll talk about these uh, position ratings really fast before we move on to catchers. Uh, the concept applies to catchers too. Uh, the position ratings are composite ratings based on their range, their arm, and their error rate, and their turn double play. How well do they play a position? 
essentially how good are you at using all of them in sync, taking the tools and turning them into results. Well, tools into ability is probably the more apt analogy for Out of the Park. The defensive ratings are the tools, position rating is the ability. Just like every other composite rating, we're pretty much going to ignore this. If a player has a 30 position rating, that just means they probably have poor ratings down here that I will uh, occasionally use position rating to really quickly look if I'm willing to play a player at a certain thanks fin. So if a player shows up like as they're eligible to play shortstop, well, what's their position rating at shortstop? Well, it's 40. Yeah, they're not playing shortstop. Like I'm not using 77 position rating at short is better than 75 position rating at short. That comes down more to these individual ratings and how they build into a uh, shortstop than the shortstop rating itself. Tim, are you gonna do this again? You are just over here getting all up in my business and I love it. Now let's talk about uh, catcher really quickly. Uh, so catcher only has two ratings. It has catcher ability and arm. Catcher ability is the rating on a card that has the most individual effects. It affects the most outcomes. It affects your framing, it affects your blocking, it affects your pass balls, it affects your error rating, it affects your catcher rating. So catcher ability, probably fairly important. It's kind of a big deal. Catcher arm is pretty much the same as infield and outfield arm. The only difference is it has a much more direct effect on a catcher's caught stealing. It also does affect the few times they do need to throw down, usually to first uh, when they're fielding. I have my hand back now. All right, now it's time to talk about pitching ratings. Pitchers have two composite ratings, and that includes the only one we actually care about. Stuff is a composite rating made up of the components of individual pitch ratings, the number of pitches, a pitcher's velocity, and to an extent their arm slot, but the arm slot really only determines how splitty a pitcher is. The game calculates all of these components into a single stuff rating, and that stuff rating is what determines whether a batter strikes out or not. An individual pitch rating doesn't determine whether a batter strikes out or not. Velocity doesn't determine whether a batter strikes out or not. Number of pitches doesn't, doesn't determine whether a batter strikes out or not. But all of those get mixed into that stuff rating to simulate how good a pitcher is at generating strikeouts. Again, individual pitch ratings don't matter on their own. Uh, what pitches a pitcher throws don't matter on their own. They only matter in the sense that they lead to the stuff rating. Stuff leads to more strikeouts. The higher your stuff, the more strikeouts you will generate. And obviously, strikeouts are pretty important most of the time. Another composite rating for pitchers is movement. And movement, we do not care a lick about. Movement is a composite rating made up of home runs and pitcher babbit. Home run prevention impacts movement a lot more than Pitcher Babbitt does. So it's, it's it's entirely possible to see a player who has extremely high movement and no Pitcher Babbitt or extremely low movement, but, but very high uh, Pitcher Babbitt. For pitchers, the home run rating is their home run prevention. Basically, how few home runs do they give up? I prefer to refer to it as PHR, uh, same as pitcher rabbit, pitcher home run. That helps me uh, think about it as well because it's prevent home runs, prevent batting average on balls in play. And then I mentioned P Babbitt. P Babbitt is pitcher rabbit, preventing Babbitt. The higher your pitcher rabbit, the lower your batting average on balls in play against. As I alluded to in the batting segment, there's a ton of balls in play just on the nature of there's about seven to nine strikeouts per game on average for the 27 outs. So you gotta get the rest on balls in play. And pitcher rabbit is what affects those balls in play. And then the last uh, kind of basic pitching rating we get is control. And control directly translates to uh, how few walks a pitcher gives up. It has no bearing on hit by pitches. It has no bearing on wild pitches. It has no bearing on how well a pitcher locates their pitch in the zone or how well a pitcher uh, hits their spot. 
all it does is speak to uh, how often a pitcher issues a walk. Then we come over to the other pitching ratings and the ground ball fly ball tendency. Um, you'll see this talked about quite a bit. It's not really worth worrying about as a beginner uh, to tournaments and a beginner to perfect team. What this does is it affects how likely a ball in play is to be a fly ball or a ground ball. It has nothing to do with home runs. It only affects balls in play. Kittens, what are you doing over there? Uh, and then velocity, pretty self-explanatory on the velocity. Uh, it's, the vo it's the base velocity. It's what their fastball will be if they throw a true fastball. If they throw a sinker or a cutter, they may not throw a pitch that fast. I mentioned arm slot earlier in the stuff rating. Normally I wouldn't talk about it. All it does is determines how splitty a pitcher is. Sidearm pitchers are splittier, uh, submarine pitchers even more so, and over the top pitchers have next to no splits, if not reverse splits. And then pitcher type absolutely does not matter as far as I can tell. Um, much more of a flavorful thing. It does have an impact in base game, but as far as anyone can tell, not in perfect team. Uh, stamina allows a pitcher to throw more pitches before they become tired. This is a little in the weeds, but I do want to explain this. So we're going to get a little in the weeds here because you have to to understand what exactly stamina does. Pitchers, you can see this Grinky has rest status of 60%. Now, all batters have this as well, but it's not nearly as convoluted for them. So the more days in a row they play, the rest, their rest status goes down. They take a day off, their rest status goes up. Pitchers are different. Pitchers, their rest status is calculated based on how many pitches they have thrown recently. You can see down here, Grinky threw 34 pitches two days ago and 28 pitches five days ago. Stamina has no impact on the recovery of rest status. Stamina impacts how many pitches a pitcher can throw in a single game before they start to get tired. If this Grinky came into a game today, he would actually be able to throw fewer pitches than he would if he was at 100% rest status. What stamina does is stamina slows down how quickly a pitcher gets to that point where they start seeing diminished effective ratings. When a pitcher gets tired in a simulation game, when they're pitching, when they're on the mound, they start to see drop-offs in their effective stuff, their effective home run prevention, their effective pitcher batter, their effective control, uh, their effective hold runners even. And so once a pitcher in, in a game gets to about 50% fatigue, they start to experience that loss of effective ratings. There's no way to like actually see this. Um, it might not be 50% exactly. Um, I could be wrong, take it with a grain of salt, but especially for a beginner video, I'm trying to convey the concept rather than the specific details, even though I'm getting fairly in the weeds here. The stamina basically determines how many pitches a pitcher can effectively throw in a game. That was an extremely roundabout way of explaining that, and I just summarized it very quickly in one sentence. This is why I ramble, because eventually I ramble enough, then I go back to summarize what I was trying to say, and bam, I just rambled my way to making my point in one sentence. If I could just like edit my live conversations, I would make a lot more sense to people I'm interacting with. So, Hold Runners is the final pitching rating we're going to talk about here. Hold Runners affects a few things. What it represents is a pitcher's ability to control runners on the base paths. Mostly runners on first and second. There's not that much control of runners on third. Here are the things that Hold Runners impacts. It lowers stolen base attempt rate, increases the caught stealing rate, uh, increases the pickoff attempts, and the pickoff successes. So now let's talk about what makes a good player, what ratings are important, what ratings aren't important, what matters. Asking what ratings are most important or what ratings aren't important or 
and what ratings matter the most, they're asking the wrong questions. There is no such thing as the most important rating, but if you're pressing me on the issue, for batters, it's I and then power and BABIP. For fielders, it's range, and for pitchers, it's pitching BABIP and, to an extent, control. But really, that's more to say it's about the shape of the card than it is the ratings. And what I mean by that is it matters how those ratings interact with the rest of the card to make the batter or pitcher work. To explain this, there's a metaphor, I'll use a metaphor of the overall budget. Now, the way overall is calculated is it's a giant composite rating of every other rating on the card. All of this stuff in here, all of this goes into this number right here. Some of these are more impactful to that rating than others. But more importantly, some of these ratings are more useful on the field when combined with other ratings. If you look at this Dave Kingman, he's got absurd amounts of power and really good eye. So this Dave Kingman card is going to hit a ton of home runs, going to walk a decent amount, but you also notice he's got low avoid Ks and Babbitt, and that means he's going to strike out a lot and not get hits on balls in play. So he's going to hit for a fairly low batting average, but a relatively good on base percentage thanks to his eye and an absurd slugging percentage. His Woba is still going to be insane. He's still going to provide an insane amount of value. A, a home run is worth two plus times a single. This Kingman is going to walk, but every home run he hits is worth three times as much, whereas this real card is basically just going to get on base. So he's got to get on base more to do as much as Kingman does. And so this Kingman is kind of what I refer to as a slugger. He's a three true outcomes guy. He's either going to hit a home run, he's going to walk, or he's going to strike out. For these kind of cards, power is important, eye is important. It doesn't really matter which one's higher than the other. It matters that they're both extremely good. Power is not better than eye. Eye is not better than power. It also doesn't matter whether he has gap power or not, because he's probably just flying out or grounding out. And speed doesn't matter. It's nice if he walks and he has speed and stealing. We'll kind of talk about defense more when I'm building the team. The defense on this card is absurd, but it doesn't need to be. These are cards that can hit so well, you don't really care about their defense being bad. Good defense is a bonus, like I said. Let's get back to Ryan Friel, because he's kind of the other side of batting that you see a lot of times where he's a contact hitter. He doesn't really hit home runs. Uh, he's got basically no power, he's still got a ton of eye, and his BABIP's much better. He strikes out less often. Uh, he's got more gap power, but not an insane amount. Um, he's got pretty good speed and stealing, but that's not necessary. He plays really good defense, but that's not necessary. All he's going to do is get on base. He gets on base, and then he advances when other people put the ball in play, get hits. He scores when other people hit home runs. A player on base is a player who has a chance to score. So that high eye, coupled with a good bat hit and good avoid Ks, means he's going to get on base a fair amount. Speed, stealing, base running, good to have more so than with the slugger, because he's going to be on base more often, but not strictly necessary. Uh, gap power, also like the slugger, he's going to get more chances to use it, so it's good to have here, but not strictly necessary. Let's also talk about uh, this is a Nino card and the Friel card, and kind of what all three of these have in common is that they're really good at defense. For this Friel card, I'm not talking about his second base defense, I'm talking about his outfield defense. And what these cards all have in common is that they have really good defense. None of these cards have their primary value derived from their defense, but they all have significant value added from their defense. Yeah, this Zanino is basically a tuned down version of Kingman at catcher. And all three of these cards have solid eye, offensive rating somewhere else, and they're above average defenders in their position. Kingman, even if he wasn't an above average defender at his position, would probably make the roster. But Zeno and to an extent Friel, their offensive ratings aren't good enough to justify them playing without that additional defense. 
and I guess we need to talk about uh, what matters for defenders. For defenders, the main thing that matters is range. Like I discussed earlier, range is what determines whether you get to a ball in your zone. If you don't get to a ball, you can't make a play on it. Arm is also especially important for third base and right field because they are throwing the furthest. This Ryan Friedel card makes a very, very good right fielder with that arm. For catchers, the main thing that matters is catcher ability. Catcher ability is the rating that affects the most things on any given play. Obviously, it's going to be important. If they have arm, that's a nice bonus, but really what you're looking for in a catcher is their catcher ability. But what about cards that really get most of their value from their defense? Rabbit Nil is not a good hitter, but he's an absurd defender, especially at second base. This card sees a ton of play in uh, cap formats because he's very efficient with his ratings. He has extremely good range and he's got a good eye. That means he's gonna have some value at the plate and he delivers extreme value with the glove. You play defense well enough, it can very much make up for an extremely poor showing at the plate. Another reason this rabbit nil card is good is because of his positional flexibility. And this is key for bench bats and utility players. So you start nine players a game, you start nine batters a game, and you're usually only running 13 to 14 batters on your roster. That's not enough to have a backup per position. So you need to have players who back up multiple positions. So even in cap formats where you don't necessarily start him, he's one of the best bench bats for those formats so he's not a complete black hole when he has to play to give a starter rest. You can also get some uh, positional flexibility in your DH. That's not always optimal because there might be a player who you just don't ever want playing in the field that you still want their bat. And another thing is you should try not to rely on a starter to back up other positions. So if, if you look here, I'm not using Ryan Freel to back up any of my positions even though he's eligible to play second, third, left, and center, I'm not using him to back those positions up because the point of resting a player is to make sure that they recover their fatigue. If Friel ends up going and playing second, and then third, and then left to back those up, he's just gonna get more tired. He's going to need so many days off because when other people get their day off, he doesn't. And there are some situations where you can use a starter to back up another position. Uh, you'll notice here I am actually using Ryan Friel v. Wright to back up at second base, uh, and I'm also using Jimmy Ryan to back up center field both ways. But in general, you don't want to rely on a starter to back up a to be the primary backup at another position. You want to have your utility one be all your bench players at every position. The next thing I want to talk about is cards that have too much reliance on their avoid Ks. And by that I mean, this Bobby Richardson has 107 avoid Ks. And you can see that only leads to 60 contacts. There's only a certain extent to which that avoid Ks can help a batter. You get to a point where all avoid Ks is doing is transforming your strikeouts into ground outs or fly outs. Those are still outs. Those still are almost exclusively non-productive. You can see he's got a ton of avoid Ks and then nothing else is really all that good. So his value is he doesn't strike out. That's not positive value, that's non-negative value. And those are very much not the same thing. Again, we go back to the idea of the overall budget. He's got that 50 overall, but most of it's in that avoid Ks. He's got a ton of rating where having a ton of rating doesn't matter. This can still be good for defensive players, utility players, or lower rated players in cap tournaments and drafts. Not striking out means you are putting the ball in play and putting the ball in play does allow for the variance of fluke single, you know, a dribbler that sneaks through or an error, but it's not delivering positive value necessarily. It's just not killing you. That's really what you need out of your bench bats in cap tournaments and drafts. 
And the last thing I want to talk about is these balance bats, like this Diego Castillo here. He does everything okay, but nothing extremely well. And what that means is he's going to hit a couple home runs. He's going to get on base a little bit. He's not going to strike out a ton, but he's also not going to walk a ton. He's not going to hit the ball in the gaps for extra bases. He doesn't have speed. He doesn't have uh, great fielding because he's spreading his ratings out among all these varying ratings, some of which don't matter as much as others. He can't specialize. The hyper specialized players usually have a uh, better value than the generalists, especially in uh, lower rated formats. Every player has weaknesses, every player has flaws, and it's making sure that those flaws aren't the ones that are going to, you know, destroy your chances to win. The last thing I want to talk about for batters and position players is balanced cards. So you can see this Diego Castillo is a very balanced batter. Uh, it does everything okay, but nothing extremely well. Uh, same with his base running, same with his fielding. He doesn't hit enough home runs, walk enough, or get enough hits to outweigh someone like Friel, who's going to walk a ton more. He's not going to hit enough home runs to get to that same value of Kingman or Nino. All right, let's talk pitching ratings. Pitching ratings, pitching shapes, all that kind of stuff. Uh, for pitching, there is a most important rating for pitchers, and it's pitching data. Uh, balls in play are the way pitchers get most of their outs, usually 18 to 20. So they need to be effective on those. They need to cut down on the hits on balls in play. Because balls in play are the most likely outcome of any plate appearance, pitcher BABIP is the most important rating. As far as shapes are concerned, we're going to start with the power pitcher, like this Bobby Witt here. Uh, so these are guys that have really, really good uh, stuff, 90, 100, 200 stuff. And then they're usually going to have either really good home run prevention or really good uh, pitching BABIP, but usually not both. Uh, in this case, he's got really good home run prevention and okay pitching BABIP. These pitchers, if they have that really good pitching BABIP, they can be effective relievers. In short outings, they're going to be effective enough that you can rely on them. But again, they need to have higher pitching BABIP than this in order for it to work. Uh, next, we're going to look at uh, control artists. Uh, you can see this Ryan Weber here. He's got extremely high control. And then they're usually going to have either decent pitching bat or decent home run prevention. But sometimes they'll be like this uh, Ryan Weber. And he's just kind of okay at both. And then sometimes they'll be like Garrett Cole, who's got extreme control, but also strikes a ton of guys out. Other times they'll be more like Ryan Weber and be more of a uh, pitch to contact kind of guy. That's actually the next kind of pitching style, pitching shape I want to I want to talk about. So here you have this Jim Bout card, and this card's good. This card's really good in iron. He's one of the top pitchers. He's got really good pitcher BABIP. He's got fairly good home run prevention. So he wants the ball to be put in play for his defense to make a play behind him. He's got okay stuff and okay control. Sometimes they'll have good stuff. Sometimes they'll have good control. Sometimes they'll actually have poor home run prevention as well. They can have really good control as well, but what's really the, the defining factor is they don't have amazing stuff to go with it. They're relying on their ability to get outs on balls at play to succeed. And then this is a pretty decent balanced pitcher here, the Keegan Thompson. Um, so this is a card I often take in drafts. Um, when I uh, run into him. He's actually got fairly solid uh, pitching BABIP for an iron card, and he's not bad at anything else. These cards can be effective in certain situations, much more so than a balanced hitter. And again, these are more of a perfect draft or cap option uh, where you're trying to choose the best of lower rated cards and you don't have the full suite of a card pool available to you. That will about wrap things up here. Uh, like I said, I ended up cutting a portion here where I built a roster based on what I talked about in this video. Um, but rather than recreating that myself, I had uh, another idea uh, today that I would see if I could get some individuals to uh, build roster based on the advice I give in this video. The people who uh, have expressed wanting to get into tournaments and perfect team and not really knowing where to begin give them this information 
make it available to them and see what they do and go through and discuss the decision making process with them what i would do what i think the roster and just kind of give that feedback i think that would be a really uh really interesting uh follow-up video to this um so i've got a couple of people in mind i want to ask about that but if you would be interested in doing that uh please feel free to leave a comment uh send me a message on discord or stop by my twitch channel um, twitch.tv slash irocths. I'm live usually every Wednesday and Thursday uh, doing Out of the Park. I do pretty much everything Out of the Park has to offer. I enjoy the whole thing. Other than that, thank you all for watching. Don't forget to uh, like, comment, and subscribe. And again, uh, follow me on Twitch for more Out of the Park content. Uh, you can also stop by, uh, ask your Out of the Park questions, join the out of the park twitch community uh just come by to see my cats they are adorable you know they haven't been present in this video and that makes me suspicious of where they are never mind the fact that i edited this video and took out any time they appeared on camera but anyway thank you all for watching and i will see you all next time